Thank you. We're back on. And uh, thanks to Audio for doing that so quickly. All right, so we will now continue with Dupella B. Can I get your last name, please, for the record? Can you state your full name for the record, please? Hello, my name is Gennady Belishev, G for short. Oh, is there a Dupella? Bella. D-U-P-E-L-A, all right, so, all right, your name? Gennady Belashev. Okay. okay. G for short. Okay, please proceed, Gennady. Hi, thank you, thank you, Senators. Can you thank you. I'm sorry, your name is not written, can you just spell your last name for us? B-B-O-Y-E-L-Y-S-H-E-V, Belishev. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, a few, a few decades ago, my family had moved uh, from or escaped communist Russia, USSR, and we moved to the state of Massachusetts. Like most people, our family dreamed and to come to America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. America has fought and stood for basic human rights and has actually become human rights standard. Many nations and countries today follow our, our guidelines. What is it that America is doing that we can do to improve? There's no hiding that. We are the world's best. America is usually the first to offer help, relief, support, and protection to nations in trouble. It's hard to believe that in a time of crisis, we could turn our back to the very thing that makes America great, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. To strip away someone's basic rights, basic rights to and privileges to discriminate and to segregate our people based on their religious beliefs, values, and even personal fears or views. Some people have fears and views that they just cannot overcome, and to discriminate against that is not helping solve the problem. These mandates, these threats, these fines, and second-class treatment of those who can't or won't comply have allowed and actually brought back workplace harassment and division among the community. Our media and our politicians have been playing doctor and king and, not, and have not allowed people to make informed consent with their doctor, with their family, and with their maker. Anything that is forced is repulsive. Rape is unlawful. To be told that one must take the vaccine or disciplinary action is a threat. It's an intimidation and actually medical rape. Has anyone considered the effects of making someone do something against their own beliefs, what that could do, the psychological, emotional, spiritual damage could actually be worse. The guilt and trauma the person will have to carry is probably worse than the virus itself. I just recently spoke to a woman who's been a GDOE teacher for over 30 years. And she said, I've had to go see a doctor because of the anxiety and stress I'm experiencing due to these discriminatory mandates. And she's like, I teach our children about our freedoms. And 30 years into it, I myself am facing this, um, this threat and my freedoms being taken away. Is this what we want? Do we really want to force, discriminate, segregate, shame those that don't agree or comply? My daughters recently were informed that they could not participate in an outdoor fishing derby because they could not provide the vaccine passport. Sound like Nazi Germany to anybody? A local, 
a local sports league that I was a part of for many years recently came out and said, if you're not vaccinated, you can no longer participate in our league. My friends, whether I am or not, I chose not to be a part of something that wants to discriminate against somebody's, like I said, medical, personal, or religious choice. So I stepped out to not have conflict with them. I'm a local coach and a referee, and we recently had to shut the doors to a sports program that has been built around helping, supporting, motivating young athletes and helping them reach their dreams because we could not subject our young athletes and their parents to such discriminatory uh, mandate. We had to shut the doors. After 18 or 16 months of closed doors, we opened, there was that window because we reached the magic 80%. And then the mandate. My parents could not go to a college or a university for one reason only. They never raised their hand and took an oath or swore an oath into the Communist Party. Today, my friends, it seems like Many people will and have already lost their jobs, their businesses, their sports programs, their status, because they refuse to swear into the vaccine party. Very, very closely linked, and be careful, my friends, what we're doing. I see a strong link, and I stand for America, and I love what America has done and is doing, and this is un-American. Our island's survival rate, I just double-checked it, is at 99.98%, 99.98% survival rate. And we are mandating a vaccine. Is it gonna provide us 150%? No. 100%? No. So why this panic? Why this fear? Why this confusion? If it's already a 99.98%, We were promised two weeks, we are fast approaching two years. We were promised 80%, that wasn't enough. We had to move the goalpost one more time. We've been blaming and shifting blame for the longest time. Somebody was playing bingo, somebody was at a karaoke, somebody came in from Philippines, always blaming somebody, but we're 18 months into it, my friends, always pointing a finger at somebody else. Recently, I met a woman that said her own uncle, she's in her mid-50s, her own uncle said, honey, don't come over unless you've been vaccinated. Uncle, I love you, I wanna see you. Please don't come and see me, FaceTime me, unless you've been vaccinated. An uncle basically dis disowned his own niece on our island, on family-like, sorry, I'm excited. Okay. Back in November, for some of you that remember, there was some special number that we could not exceed for gatherings. So an elderly Manumco couple called us up, hush, hush, Mr. G, you want to pick up some balutan? Of course. We went down there, knocked on the door. They opened the door and it reminded me, folks, please listen of what communism was 50 years ago when they open the window and check who's behind you. It was the same exact thing. This is a Manumco couple that just wanted to give us some balutan. And they said, anybody behind you? No, why? Okay, just want to make sure. They let us in, gave us some food, said, happy Thanksgiving. And we went back and I was like, what was that about? They weren't joking. They were afraid to give me some balutan on their island. This is a Manumco couple. Folks, the goalpost has moved so many times. I want to inform you that those that feel they are completely safe and protected because they are fully vaccinated, 
I am telling you, your goalpost is about to move. It will expire soon and you will be mandated with the booster shots or you will lose the status and no longer be able to hold your job, so on and so forth. And again, I want to ask many more questions. Folks, do you expect me to stand in front of a gym and turn away young athletes and tell them, no, you cannot come into this gym. I have served you, I have helped you. I want you to reach your Olympic goals, your college goals, your high school goals, but I will not let you in because you cannot provide me papers. I will not do that as a coach. I love them too much. I love our island. I love our people. God bless you. Sujus Masi. Sujus Masi. Ms. Daisy Belishev. Half a day. My name is Daisy Belishev and I'm 14 years old. And I'm for the uh, Bill 180. This is my second year of homeschooling. I really enjoy homeschooling because looking at the school system on Guam right now, there's a lot of fear, misunderstanding, confusion, and discrimination. As people, we all love to have people around us to eat together and spend time together. And when my family moved here, we saw Guam was all about that. Now, people are terrified of other people coming close to get sick. I know that as an American, I used to have the right to choose what I do and do not want to put into my body. I'm a healthy and active person who believes that I don't need the vaccine because I have an immune system that is made to, to fight. My mom signed up my sister and I for the fishing derby and we were all set. After the governor's new mandate, agriculture called my mom and told her that if her daughters that were 12 years old and up weren't vaccinated, will not be allowed to participate in the outdoor fishing derby. Also, my mom wanted to take my sisters and I to PIC to enjoy the water park. She called them and they told her that we cannot enter if we weren't vaccinated. Do you think this is right? America is the greatest country in the world because it was built on having the freedom to choose. And I see how that standard America used to have is slowly fading away. Please, I've seen so many testimonies on how people are scared about losing their jobs because they won't get vaccinated. They're scared they can't choose what they think is better for them and what they want to put into their body. I personally am terrified of the vaccine because I don't know its side effects and yet the government is pushing it on us so hard. I see how unsure everything is, how the rules are ever changing and how the promise the governor gave to the vaccinated on not having to wear the mask has not been fulfilled. If the vaccine isn't 100% guaranteed, and the survival rate of COVID on Guam is 99.9%, .9%. I do not see the point in taking the vaccine. I want to ask everyone that makes these decisions for Guam and its residents to stop pushing, threatening, and forcing us into getting vaccinated. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Daisy. Mr. David Flores. Half a day, and I want to thank you for your time. I know it's been a long day. It's been a long day for me, so I know that everybody's tired. But I'm going to try to speak quickly to make sure that I get my information out. My name is David Flores, and I am an indigenous descendant of this island, son of a proud race, son of war survivors, both World War II and the Spanish Chamorro Wars, and an American as per the Organic Act. I am not anti-vaccine. I am not anti-government. I am not anti-governor. I'm not anti lu What I am against are the mandates and attempts to take away my freedom through fines, punishment, coercion, and deprivation of access afforded to others. I am here to say that I am vehemently opposed to someone forcing me to take this unapproved, untested, experimental vaccine. And yes, I am probably preaching to the choir. 
As a patient, I am allowed to seek second, even third opinions. I am allowed to question and refuse if I choose any prescription or path of treatment. That is my right to accept or refuse any treatment. Neither the doctors, nor the government, nor the pharmaceutical companies backing this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine own this descendant of a proud race. I own this body. But now there are bills and mandates that seek to take away my right to choose my own path of treatment. And there are steps taken to demonize me as a spreader of a pandemic that has not even been isolated and identified. And that is ludicrous chicanery. It was announced that if one gets this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine, it would save lives. It was announced that if you took the vaccine, it would stop the spread of this virus. This hasn't happened. Now we are told that this spike is, in cases is due to those who refuse to take this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine, and I will continue to repeat it because the media says otherwise. Guess what? Data does not support that statement. Let me repeat that. You have no data to support that persons who do not take this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine are the cause of the spread of this current spike. And if you continue to state that, then I would like you, and I'm not speaking to you, I'm talking to the public health and whoever else, I would like you to cite and present the scientific study that presents this data. Not opinions, actual data and numbers from a legitimate study that indicate that you know for a certainty that those who choose not to receive this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine are the cause of this spike. If you cannot produce that, I mean, do not quote to me or give me a report of how many new cases you have and the, your opinions on what caused them, but give me a report of data from a direct study that indicates and deduces that those who have not taken this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine are the source of this spike in new cases. I want legitimate statistical data that proves unequivocally that those who refuse this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine is the cause of these spikes. If you cannot show me that data now, then this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine is not only unnecessary, but dangerous and in essence an attempt at genocide of the descendants of this proud race of Chamorai and those who currently reside on this island. The Spanish attempted that and they have almost succeeded to some extent because I see that in your documents you list Spanish counting, Spanish days of the week and a Spanish calendar, calendar. And no, I do not digress. It is along this same line, it is with this same propaganda methods that are taking place on our island today that were utilized previously. This modern day attempt at genocide utilizes education and coercion, the same methods of the Spanish over two centuries ago. This is an unapproved, untested experimental vaccine that you are forcing through coercion and deprivation for people to get. You have no data on it because humans are being used as the animal tribes for these companies. These are companies who are exempt from liability and companies who are all too eager to jump at the chance to push out a product without the normal stipulations and guidelines. The effects, the data, and the reports of this unapproved, untested experiment, experimental vaccine are not available to us because the animal trials are going on right now, and they are going on humans. To force individuals through coercion and deprivation of rights to take this unapproved, untested experimental vaccine is not only illegal, it is inhumane and immoral, and it is a sin against God. In closing, I would like to quote excerpts from the Megalahi speech, and I have paraphrased, paraphrased it a little bit to make it applicable to today. They treat us as gross people and regard us as barbarians, but do we have to believe them? Under the excuse of instructing us, they are corrupting us. They take away from us the primitive simplicity in which we live. They dare to take away our liberty, which should be dearer to us than life itself. 
to try to persuade us that we will be happier, and some of us have been blinded into believing their words. But can we have such sentiments if we reflect that since these mandates have come in, we have been covered with misery and illness? They have come to disturb our peace. For what purpose do they teach us or accept, expect to make us adopt these customs? To subject us to their laws and to remove the precious liberty le left to us by our ancestors? In a word, they are trying to make us unhappy in the hope of an ephemeral, ephemeral oh, sorry, happiness which can be enjoy, enjoyed only after this pandemic or this disease is gone. Haven't we the same right concerning that which they teach us is uncontestable truths? They exploit our simplicity and good faith. All their skills are directed towards tricking us. All their knowledge tends only to make us unhappy. If we are ignorant and blind, it is, they, it is because they believe we have learned their evil plans too late and have allowed them to settle here. Let us not lose courage in the presence of misfortune. They are only a handful. We can easily defeat them. Even though we don't have their deadly weapons or the use of social media, we are stronger than we think. We can quickly free ourselves from these foreigners and these foreign policies. We must regain our former freedom. And now hear from Mr. Paul Suba. Good evening. Madam Chair, Senators, thank you for taking the time, your time, to address something so serious in Guam's history and maybe the world history right now. You asked a question earlier, and I was listening. You asked one of the other panelists, how do we feel about the fact that there are some Senators not here? I am in support of both bills, however, I don't agree with the one sentence that says you need a majority, because if we can't even get a majority here right now, and this is bigger than the administration, this is bigger than any governor in our history, I believe. This is bigger than just the people sitting in this room or the few people that are resistant to being forced to be mandated. And I'll tell you why from my own personal view and observation. You know, many of you know me. As a law enforcement officer for 40 years and a chief of police, and why? Senator Frank, you know why we join. We, because we love our people, we love human beings. We love to protect them and to investigate. Why are we being called herds? The herd immunity is taken way out of context because everything that I know from biology and listening to scientists and doctors from both sides of the equation, natural immunity, when I get a flu, which I know many flus when I was a kid growing up, God bless my mother, she took care of five of us when we thought we were all dying from the flu. The kids were throwing up everywhere. There were other things happening that Everyone got the flu, but yet we overcame because of our natural immunity that was God-given in our system. Now today, the reason why there is this division amongst the people, and I guarantee there are some that are vaccinated that wish they didn't get vaccinated because new data is coming out, and they're seeing other people getting sick, and they're seeing people in the hospital that are vaccinated, and we're being told that, well, you're not going to have a serious illness or die. Well, we're also told that the reason why those folks are dying, God bless their souls and, and rest their souls, is because they have comorbidities. I was told by the former lieutenant governor, Dr. Cruz, look, Paul, look around the island. We have more dialysis centers on our island than we do health clubs and health facilities. There's a division among the experts. Don't blame the people. The people are only looking for answers and reasons why. And they're being fed so much information, some right, some not. 
I share it with some of my friends. They say, hey, why are you saying that? You didn't fact check. Well, who am I going to fact check? Google, Google, from what I'm understanding. They're corrupted with all kinds of ideas that, that, that are related to, to money. And it always, say, they say, follow the money. Okay, follow the money. My concern is, what's the last report? 10,000 so such, 900 that tested positive. That does not equate to people die, being a death sentence. It doesn't, because they recovered. Where are they? I know many of them. Yes, they went through some, some good, some not too good, but they all recovered. The ones that we are told have passed away are those that have those comorbidities. So if the issue is the unvaccinated are dangerous too, and by the way, I got tested, right? And I came out negative. So my friends that got vaccinated, I said, hey, let me give you a hug. They said, no, no. I said, why? Because I can still get it and I can still pass it on. I said, then you stay away from me now because I'm clean. <laughs> they said, I don't have it. So what is the point? The people that are vaccinated, they're concerned because they're hearing from, from various sources around the world that are not getting in our national news here, in our local news, that there are problems with the vaccine. And I don't want to scare people that have been vaccinated. But what I do want to ask is those that are forcing vaccines, even the doctors you've heard from and some medical specialists, what if you're wrong? What if you're wrong and you forced all these people to take something that now, when they were healthy, like we've heard some stories, they will die or they're going to suffer long-term maladies. If I am guilty of being a bad citizen because I'm not getting vaccinated and I could put somebody in the hospital or maybe I'll go there and I'll overwhelm the hospital, then the problem is not the vaccine or the vaccinated or the unvaccinated. The problem is in the hospital because the hospital has had problems years and years and years ago. When my grandmother was ill, she went into the emergency room. I won't mention the name of the hospital, but it was the only one then. And she couldn't even be seen. She was left in the hallway begging for somebody to come see her for eight hours. Senator, you know that traffic collisions on Guam put many people in the hospital. You know how many funerals the police department escorts almost daily now? And that was before COVID-19. People die from so many things. I sent a chart to uh, Senator Moylan. I sent a chart and it showed the numbers of deaths and the, the, the statistics and vaccinated, unvaccinated is at the low end of the spectrum. Not to say it's not dangerous. I agree, it's dangerous. But even the common cold is dangerous to some people. So I'm going to end it with this. We have a God-given right. Somebody, some other speaker on, on, on the internet or the online said, it, it, is, um, it is an um, un-American to mandate. It is un-American. Our constitutional rights oversee any governmental, local governmental policy, procedures, ideologies, whatever. Look at every other government in the United States of America. They differ from one state to the other, one city, one town. They all differ. There are some that feel they have to mandate out of fear, and there are others that feel that it is still a human being's right. Let me just end with this. We all believe in God. I really honestly believe. Everyone in this room, everyone on this island practically, 99.9%, .9 just like the virus uh, you know, issue, <laughs> we can survive. We believe that God, in the Garden of Eden, gave Adam and Eve a choice. You eat this fruit from this tree and you will die. But if you eat everything else, then you're, you'll be okay. Even God himself gave us a choice, even though he knew it could end in death. And because of the choice that those two made, everyone on this planet for generations needed a savior. And then he himself took the virus called sin, and he died, so we won't die. Who are we going to put our trust in? We cannot trust, yes, ma'am, 
Sorry, uh, Honorable Chairwoman, Chairperson. How can the people trust the scientists and specialists and experts when they can't even agree on what is and what isn't? And now many of them are saying that um, it's more dangerous to conclude that everyone needs the vaccine. What about the people that can't take the vaccine? They can spread it, right? They're sick, they go to bingo or wherever, but they couldn't get the vaccine. What about the ones that are vaccinated? They're spreading the vaccine, uh, the virus. People come and go from this island. So if every one of us in this room were vaccinated, the 100% that they needed to reach, is there a guarantee? I doubt it, just like these other folks have stated. And my doctor, I have two doctors, by the way. One said, Paul, get vaccinated. But I can't guarantee you won't die. You're 65, you got maybe some things that might cause, you know, because you're allergic to things. The other doctor said, if you get sick, you come and see me, I have medication that will address your illness. Two different doctors, my doctors, aren't in agreement. No mandate should be imposed upon good people. And here's one last thing. Please conclude. I know, I know. But you want, they want, somebody wants to make it an issuing of citations or some form of punishment. They're not enforcing a lot of things on the island, and now we're going to criminalize people that want to make a decision for their own personal health or their family? You want to see who's going to enforce that? And by the way, when people stop working because they can't go to work, we're already short of people that are supposed to be working in the hospital, uh, supposed to be working in the schools. Where are they going to go? How are they going to get somebody? They're going to off-island hire people that are vaccinated? I don't know. But thank you. Thank you, Chief Suba. Thank you to the panel. If you would like to wait uh, for any questions from the senators, I'm going to call the other panel in, though, right now, if you can. Thank you. We'll begin um, with Eileen Ramiro. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. We're the last bunch, but not least, hopefully. If you could please put your microphones uh, in front of you so that it's not at an angle. We just seem to have problems at the angles. Thank you. And please, everyone, 
Uh, I guess you're the last panel for the night, but I'm still going to ask you to keep your testimony to five minutes. Thank you. I'm just going to read a letter that I've addressed to you earlier today. Um, my name is Eileen Ramiro. I'm a mother of three, and uh, we are also a business, a small business owner. We're from Chalanpago. Uh, I'm a homeschool mom for many, many years. I'm also a volunteer uh, member of uh, several organizations, but I, I'm here to speak for myself and my belief and what I stand for. Um, Twelve years ago, when I was diagnosed with cancer, my family and I had to decide regarding the best course of action to save my life and that of my unborn baby. I was pregnant at that time. I was probably the first patient, cancer patient, who was pregnant at that time. Um, two years thereafter, we were at the same fort, determining how to save mine. So the cancer came back. As I am reading this letter, it is evident that we chose what was best for my child, who is now 12 years old, healthy, and for myself. I'm alive and well, thank the Lord. With the current government overreach, the right to choose what we know as best for our bodies and that of our children is taken away. Whether or not citizens like me agree that an experimental drug is safe to inject to our children's bodies and our bodies is not my narrative. But the right to choose for ourselves and not the government making that decision. Thank you. The government do not own us, although its action recently has shown that its intent to do just that. The government's abuse of power is evident by the executive orders that the government of Guam has been issuing, ignoring the input from the medical and economic advisors, the legislators, and the community. The people of Guam is in danger of losing one of our rights guaranteed by the United States Constitution. I am an immigrant here. I came here when I was 16. This has been my home. And for the first time, we, as a family, we have to face a decision. Is this what our children will face over and over again? Do we move to Florida, where people are free, guaranteed by the laws passed by their government. I urge you to stop our governor from enslaving us and the future generations of this island to come. Otherwise, especially those senators that are not here because we're speaking to the crowd right now. Why are they not here to represent the people who elected them to do just that? So, doing nothing, you will be remembered in history as the legislature that ceded the government's power, that sealed the government's power to enslave its people. In closing, I just want to read just a section of a speech by John Stuart Mill around 1867. Let not any pacify his conscience by the delusion that he can do no harm if he takes no part and forms no opinion. Bad men need nothing more to come past their ends then that good man should look on and do nothing. He's not a good man who, without a protest, allows wrong to be committed in his name and with the means which he helps to supply because he will not trouble himself to use his mind on the subject. In other words, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And I strongly believe that those our representatives that are here are doing something. 
But those that are not here, they are allowing evil to exist and to thrive because taking away our rights to make decisions concerning our own bodies, our livelihood, is pure evil. Abuse of power, whatever you call it, it's pure evil. And that's what I come here to testify against. So I am in support of the bills that you are trying to amend to pass. It's not the best solution, but I truly believe it is a step towards the right direction because we showed up. So many people showed up. We protested. I've never done that in my life. But we show the government that we are the people and the government should be for the people. It's not the other way around. Thank you so much. Thank Lord. you very much, Ms. Ramiro. We'll now hear from Bistra Mendiola. Is there a Bistra? Hopefully. Is there a Bistra Mendiola? Yes. Hopefully. Yes, thank you. My name is B Bistra Mendiola, and I'm a registered voter, District Order Chalampago. I'm here today to testify in support of Bill 180-36, and I will be commenting on 176 as well. Recently, our government issued an order, 2021-20, with her vaccination requirements for establishments and organized activities. It requires staff and patrons to show proof of vaccination. This, in essence, contradicts the law relative to the disclosure of protected health information as prescribed by law in Title 10, Chapter 19, Section 19607, Paragraph A and B. And this is the very same laws that we keep hearing over and over again because this is the emergency power authorization. Moreover, individuals and businesses who fail to comply are now subject to fines. I took the liberty of examining the basis of this EO, and this is what I concluded. One, our governor cited the laws concerning the authority over persons under the Title 10 chapters 3 and 19. She based her decision also on opinion, opinion, not a law, opinion, issued by the U.S. Department of Justice, concluding that Session 564 of FDA Drugs and Cosmetic Act permits public and private employers alike to impose vaccination as a condition of employment. She also used the report by the CDC dated April 2nd, 2021, which estimates the COVID-19 vaccine effectiveness. Today is September 3rd. And we all know that there is new massive data showing the contrary of these early findings. As an example, look up the study by the Israelis, which was publicized just a few days ago. Also, we can see the ever-increasing number of local patients who are hospitalized even after being fully vaccinated. The latest Duke Hospital Census shows 55 patients of whom 23 are fully vaccinated, or that's 42% of current patients. The Organic Act of Guam gives our governor powers to issue fines, yes, but it also states he shall be responsible for the faithful execution of the laws of Guam and the laws of the United States applicable in Guam. He shall have the power to issue executive orders and regulations not in conflict with any applicable law. In our case, the applicable laws here is in Title 10 GCA, Chapter 3, and Chapter 19. In Title 10, Chapter 19, Article 1, Section 190102, your legislative predecessors found that emergency health powers must be grounded in a thorough scientific understanding of the public health threats and disease transmission. We all know now that's not the case, thanks to the brave disclosure of one of our top medical doctors. And we know of the latest findings worldwide relative to the effectiveness of the COVID-19 vaccines over time. They're decreasing. This is being publicized in major medical journals. It's not a rumor. However, natural immunity is being proven over and over as providing just as good protection. In some cases, it provided better protection versus vaccination only. 
That's in the Israeli study. In addition, the previous Guam legislators found that the rights of people to liberty, bodily integrity, and privacy must be respected to the fullest extent possible. After further research into the Title 10 GCA Chapter 19, I found that this executive order is in direct violation of Section 19607. In Title 10 GCA Health and Safety, Chapter 19, Section 19607 is relative to the access to and disclosure protected of protected health information. We all know what we're required right now as businesses. You must show your proof of vaccination immunization record. The law states otherwise. Access to protected health information of persons who have participated in medical testing, treatment, vaccination, isolation, or quarantine programs or efforts by the public health authority during a public health emergency shall be limited to those persons having a legitimate need to acquire or use that information not the business owner, and there is a very specific prescription. Who has the right to this? Number one, provide treatment to the individual, a.k.a. A medical doctor. Conduct epidemiological research or investigate the causes of transmission. That's it. This is what the law says. Paragraph B is relative to the disclosure of such information. Protected health information held by the public health authority shall not be disclosed to others without individual written specific informed consent except for disclosures made directly to the individual, the individual's family, appropriate federal agency, pursuant to court order, or to identify the deceased individual. Similar provisions exist in Title 10, Chapter 3, Section 3326, Subsection 1, and Section 3327. They all regulate the confidentiality of immunization records. Bill 18036 aims to limit the powers vested in a single branch of our government. This limitation is an integral part of our democratic society. Furthermore, as a business owner, I refuse to be placed in a position where I must act as an agent of power to the government. This is not my job. And I refuse to be threatened with fines or business closures pursuant to this such a mandate. Our fragile economy has suffered enough and I implore you senators to stand up for the people once again. Take back the power given to you as a separate branch of this government and stop unlawful executive orders pouring down on us, the people of Guam. And let me make a brief comment on 176, where this, it's relative to the um, fully um, approved by FTA vaccines. Uh, there were a lot of testimonies from our government officials, from both from public health and GMH, who are vouching for the safety and effectiveness. Well, let me ask this question for the record, how can anyone vouch for the safety and effectiveness of any vaccine? I'm not arguing whether fully approved or not, but in this case, let me show you what the manufacturer themselves are stating in their fact sheet, which is being distributed. This may not be all possible side effects to the vaccine. Serious and unexpected side effects may occur the possible effects of the vaccine are still being studied in clinical trials. What does, what does that mean? Are still being in clinical trials? We are the clinical trial worldwide. So anyone, I don't care if you're a medical professional or not, but they, they, they try and impose something that even the manufacturer does not know whether or not it's safe or effective. I'm sorry, what are we talking about here? So once again, I just wanted to thank you for this opportunity. And for the record, I'm really, really, really disappointed that I don't see any of uh, your fellow Democratic representatives because I'm a registered Democrat. Very disappointed. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Manjolia. We'll now hear from Brianne Bliss.
Brianne, please proceed. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to, uh, mine's not quite as lengthy. Um, just wanted to do kind of a short thing here. Of course, I've got my flag. Um, and I am in support of these bills, so. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Have you grown up reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? Is it still said in school anymore? Do children or even adults understand what this pledge means? Or is it just ritual at this point? When was the last time you covered your heart and pledged your allegiance to the American flag? Many men and women fought for our freedoms, my grandfathers included. Many died. What are you willing to go through for your freedom? Would you just sacrifice it to the COVID cause or stand up and fight for your rights as our forefathers have? And to the republic for which it stands. What is a republic? Type it into Google and even it says, a state in which supreme power is held by the people and their elected representatives and which has an elected or nominated president rather than a monarch. From what I can tell, it seems like any authority or power is granted by the people. Government is there for the people to help, not to hurt. One nation under God. We seem to have forgotten who our God is. We fear a virus instead of trusting the natural immune systems that we all are given. Although the vaccine is there for those who truly need it, the elderly and the sick, the majority of society should rest assured knowing that our bodies are robust and complex systems that can tackle many germs, bacteria, fungi, and viruses. Healthy living should be promoted for everyone instead of fearful living. Indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Indivisible. Right now, as I write this, we are definitely facing some intense division. Never in my life have I had someone lecture me about my health because I was unvaccinated, but now I have. Never have I been shut out of society and coerced by my bosses and governments to take an EUA vaccination, but now I have. People are waiting in mile-long lines for COVID testing because of fear, fear of having a virus or fear of losing his job. I have seen people ridicule these actions all over social media. They're ridiculed for a right to live. Are we not granted certain inalienable rights as American citizens? Are we not allowed to have more than one option in living when it comes to this virus, which spreads regardless of vaccination status? Whether we choose to promote healthy living or to take the vaccine, freedom of choice should not be optional. Freedom should be the standard. Thank you. Thank you, Brianne, Ms. Bliss. We'll now hear from Kevin Nace. Hello, my name is Kevin Nace. Um, I don't know what that, I really didn't read the bill or anything, but um, uh, hang on a second, let me get to my notes. Okay, um, uh, first thing I want to say is that, you know, I'm really disappointed that there's not more senators here. It's like, it's kind of, kind of wrong, you know. Uh, it's not, for something that's really this important, they just don't give, well, I'm not going to say a word, but you understand what I'm saying, right? Okay, um, so uh, let, let's be honest about this, okay? This is not about a virus. This is about control, control over our lives. You know, <laughs> you guys say, jump, we jump. And if we don't jump, you, you'll persecute us for it. <laughs> uh, you'll say, go get a vaccine. If you don't get the vaccine, we're going to keep you from going. We're, we're going to keep you from, from, uh, from participating in society, you know. Uh, as it stands right now, uh, I guess we're not allowed to go into restaurants and bars and clubs and uh, multiple other places because we're, we refuse to, to let you or let, let the pharmaceutical industry or the, or the government inject us with, with these poisons. You know, 
I see it as poisons. You, you, you all might, might see it as in, well, it's a savior. Well, in that case, then fine. Get vaccinated. Take as much as you like, but don't force it on us. You know, <laughs> I am a free citizen. I've been on Guam for 52 years, you know? This is my home. And I, I don't want any government dictating what I should put into my body just, just to appease you, you know? Um, <laughs> um, uh, I, I, like, I wish there was more of you here so, so I can ask which of you are actually pushing for these vaccines because those are the people that need to be taken out of office and people need to, we need to have more senators in here that, that actually want to do what's best for the people, not best for themselves. <laughs> Sorry, I get really nervous when I talk, okay? So, so um, um, you know. Uh, <laughs> Take your time. You know, there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that go on in the government, right? Uh, I, I'm looking at, and there's a $600 million that the governor got in, and she's holding it for who knows what reason. She's not giving it out to the people. It should have been for the people, but she's not. And, and they're forcing vaccines on people. And I, 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 know some, I know some people that own some businesses out here, and... I guess DPHSS or whatever the hell, they, they went in there and told them if they did not get vaccinated, they would lose their business license. Now, if that's the case, then that means they're going to come to me at my business and try and force me to get vaccinated too. I don't know how true that is, but that's what I was told. Now, you, you shake your head no, but, uh, but why, why would these business owners come to me and lie to me about this stuff? You know, uh, that... That, that is exactly where we're headed. You're, you're, uh, you're, you're telling people that, that um, you're telling people that if they do not get vaccinated, they cannot, they cannot participate in society. And you're going to go to businesses and you're telling them, well, well, you have to get vaccinated and you have to push your, your employees to get vaccinated. Now, uh, uh, OSHA came out and. Uh, <laughs> OSHA came out and said that, uh, that if the employers push their, their, their employees to get vaccinated and they have a vaccine injury, the employer is going to be held responsible for that. It's not going to come down on the government. It's going to come down on the employer. But yet the, gov the government says you must tell your employees to get, get vaccinated. That's a double-edged sword. You know, you're doomed if you do and you're doomed if you don't. You know, this, this stuff's got to stop. You know, like, like I said, this is not about the vaccine. This is not about, about a virus. This is about control. This muzzle, this muzzle right here, this here, this is control. If I take it off right now, people will freak, oh my God, he's not wearing a mask. Oh, we're going to get infected. Well, that's kind of bullshit. I'm sorry about my language. Sorry. I try not to cuss, I, but, you know, this is stupid. We all know that this doesn't do anything. This mask, I can breathe through this. I can, I can feel my breath go through my mask. People have been touching this, and I got my hands all over it. Look at this. Oh, my God, I'm not catching a disease. This is stupid. You know, you, 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 government officials playing God here, you know, Okay, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nace. We'll now hear from Romeo Carlos. Am we on here? Thank you for um, letting me have my say tonight. My name is Romeo Carlos. I am um, a former legislative uh, worker uh, work specializing in policy, particularly health care insurance and things like that. Um, I come out tonight in opposition to both of these bills precisely because of the type of misguided 
infodemic that we see here paraded in front of us. I was home watching TV, enjoying a post-birthday um, tranquility. Turning on the hearing and listening to some of the just over-the-top rhetoric that is clearly uninformed and misguided was aggravating. And I think this effort on the part of these two bills and the people who initiated them contribute to this type of folly that we see, that we just heard. In a nutshell, really quickly, we've heard about an individual saying they'd rather move to Florida, which if it were an independent country would have the third highest rate of COVID deaths and hospitalizations in the world. Currently has no ICU beds for children, for children who are gravely impacted by the Delta variant, unlike any of the previous strains before. We've heard doctors and lawyers all talking about constitutionality, but overlooking the fact that in 1905, Jacobson versus Massachusetts established through the US Supreme Court and has been upheld ever since, giving the states the authority to mandate a vaccine in the best interest of the public when a minority of resistance would infect the majority. I further oppose this bill because I just think you guys got it wrong. Lou Leon Guerrero, our governor, it, at no point and no time in any of the language that I've read, and I speak English fairly well, and I think I read it even better, mandates any vaccine. No one takes away any choice. In fact, it's very clear. Show proof of your vaccination or choose to take a test, which, by the way, is free. The monies that everyone seems to be so concerned about do not accrue to the governor or to her bank or to the clinics per se but were provided by the national government for precisely that purpose. There is no mandate. The fact that she has no functional communications department or anyone managing the front office to help communicate this really complicates things for people. This, this thing about businesses that had the speaker shaking her head demonstrates the ludicrousness that is allowed to fester and, and, and rot in the public space when there's a vacuum of communication. Communications, strategic communications, are a key and essential part of any pandemic public health emergency management structure. And in that, for those of you who want to beat up on the governor, there's a point. The only thing that I did find distasteful was the idea that they would penalize people financially. That was really, whoever suggested that should be fired, if you're watching Gov. Um, that's just ridiculous. But writing these kinds of bills, encouraging this kind of nonsense, does a disservice to the people of Guam, to the governor, and to the safety of the most vulnerable in our community. You should be sitting down explaining to her why this is not workable. To the individual who brought up the issue of HIPAA violations when asked for a vaccine, uh, no, it's not. It is not a HIPAA violation to ask for a vaccine if you're a business. I believe HIPAA violations are actually, um, excuse me, it's been a while since I've worked in this area, but it pertains to medical professionals, medical industries, and associated business partners with those medical professionals. Businesses are clearly allowed to ask for proof of vaccine. No one, there was a gentleman here earlier who said he wants a study to see this and to see that. Well, you know, they're actually right there. Um, we heard earlier testimony just moments ago about one of Israel's uh, most recent studies, although it was misquoted. Um, the information did not actually, cited, did not actually state that natural immunity is better. When you are infected, you have antibodies. When you have an injection on top of that, you're doubly protected. One of the biggest problems that we have, like I said, is that void in Adeloupe. 
but also in each one of your offices when your paid staffers fail to do the research to inform you how the vaccine works. The vaccines were never meant to stop transmission. The vaccines were meant to reduce severe disease and mortality. When a vaccinated person is reinfected, it is at a less severe rate and almost no deaths. Birth controls are not 100% and you can still get pregnant. You can put on a safety belt, follow the rules of the road, and stop at the red lights and the stop signs, and still get seriously hurt in a car accident. But we don't abolish the safety regula regulations of our roadways. We don't abolish birth controls, which ironically, for the Democratic senators who people keep saying are not here, they're watching. They're not here. One person is actually in a hospital by her husband's bedside who has a serious operation that they're waiting. But the others are there and they're watching. And no, they don't want to be here because guess what? Delta is a problem. One of the things that disturbs me most about this effort from the political set, political puffery, the political reprobates trying to make profit off of the governor's inability to articulate through her comms department, which is like non-existent, is the aspect that she has done an amazing job. And as a critic, I write something called Guam Blog, and anyone will tell you I've been very critical, particularly in the beginning of this. This governor has led this island through the worst global pandemic in the recorded history. It's universally impacted every nation at the same time and economies. Yet she leads every state in the union in how we achieved an 80% threshold. She has achieved it before all the regional countries. 80% was the magic number for herd immunity that we will not reach because of the vaccine hesitancy, which is fed and stoked by charlatan legislation and commentary from innocently misguided, willfully ignorant, and political profiteers. I, I hope, after seeing this parade of nonsense tonight, from even a lawyer who talked about constitutionality and failed to recognize the fact that if the governor did choose to mandate it, it w is within her rights. But there is no mandate, there is a choice. And that choice is get vaccinated or take a test that you don't have to pay for. No one's forcing you to do anything. The only thing you're doing is playing up and exaggerating this hyper hyperbole for emotional politici political, uh, politicization of a pandemic. You put profit and political ambitions before public health. And the mental health issue is front page news. This type of Nonsense really prejudicates all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Romero. I'm sorry, Mr. Carlos. Thank you. We have uh, now Mr. Cruz and then Angela. Mr. Cruz. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, and I was going to say a lot of... Uh, a lot of the things that I wanted to say, but this gentleman here said most of the things that he said. So uh, in order for me to just, you know, cut the time, because uh, I like to say that the um, mosquitoes out there were really bad. They're biting my legs. And anyway, this is the first time I came to the legislature's office. Okay. Uh, anyway, uh, I like to speak on my own vernacular, which is Chamorro. Uh, and I want to say that Estis here, Ipo van Mandulu, Debina van Manai, Aturidat ne Epo my decidi half a Malagonia. Munga ma fesa si tauto. Munga ma spontai tauto. 
mga mas pante ito din siya business ni pun ni pun uh, sangani na po man madulo kita uto esti dilo gagi keno ujung ni man mahano ti sigurao ko guaha mino legne o babonya lo esti siya na i ibaba masoda sta graphene oxide masoda sa pun siga pun dulo kita tauta ni no Bula po fan mata ay sempre. Nesaw tungo na gababag sa nalom niya, munga masasedi na po fan madulo kita ito. Munga mas pantay business ni po fan madulo kita ito. So, tayo ay tao ito di city. Kung mulilin mo na si Biden gati kay na presidente kay lago kay Estados Unidos pentatizin nila nga mandate at na fabidana kay ka Afghanistan. Ko edzu malagomu pun titi titi, ego bednu pun titi titi sana tau tau, fa mak mat fan lay, tak mu sesedi, na pun fan na cine cinema pagi ni saya nak kasih momen tu, pula nak saya babarias, fa mak mat. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Angela, could you please state your full name for the record? Angela Beckwith. Beckwith. I'm sorry. B E C K W I T H. Okay. Beckwith. Thank you. May I proceed? Please proceed. So, hello. My name is Angela, and I am for both Bill 17636 and 18036. I am a wife and a homeschooling mom of three very happy and very healthy kids. I was born in India and moved to the US 20 years ago. For the past four years, I have called Guam my home. I am thankful to have this opportunity to speak out about an issue that directly or indirectly affects us all. For the last 18 months, we have all been subjected to unprecedented change in our daily lives. In the name of health and public safety, we have willingly submitted to regulations and mandates that have dramatically changed the way we live our lives. For some of us, this may have meant yeah, a little more than wearing an extra accessory or eating takeout instead of going in. We have delayed or canceled travel plans and major life decisions. For others, it has resulted in increasing isolation, loneliness, and even mental health concerns. For some, it has spelled the end of a family business that has endured for generations. And for a great many, it has had devastating consequences socially, emotionally, and financially. We have changed the way we live our lives, the plans we make, and the hopes we have for our children and future generations. And for the most part, we have taken it in stride and done so freely. We have done this because we have been told that the best and most reliable conclusions of science and medicine require it for the greater good. Many of us have questioned the prevailing wisdom. Many decent, educated, good, intelligent people do not simply accept changes that may adversely affect themselves or their loved ones on the authority of experts. Like me, they require a burden of proof before implementing changes that may do more harm than good, short and long term. Many of us feel like we should have the right to carefully weigh the opinions of the experts while doing our own research, asking the hard questions, demanding the evidence. And there is a great deal of evidence that leads us to pause. What this executive order has done is it has taken that freedom away from us, we the people, and we are told to simply trust and obey. Trust and obey the healthcare expert, even in the face of solid contrary evidence, never mind, you know, that their opinions change from one week to the next. Trust and obey our politicians because they, there will be consequences if we don't, even though those with the power to drastically change our lives don't always follow their own dictates or hold their own families to the same standards. So trust and obey, or else. Or else what? We are already seeing what. We will be treated as second-class citizens, barred from malls and restaurants, fired or not hired because of our vaccination choices, fined 
perhaps imprisoned for non-compliance, maligned, slandered, called ignorant, selfish, anti-science, and hateful, silenced and canceled when we speak out. The problem with these COVID-19 vaccines, what's unique about this situation, is that it has, made, it has been made abundantly clear that we are not welcome to question the narrative propagated by these experts. This has divided individuals, families, and communities, not on the basis of race or religion, but on the basis of a vaccination status. It's a new form of segregation. And we are not to question it, much less dissent. Today I ask, what has been done in the last 18 months to create or expand the capacity at GMH? What has been done in the last 18 months in the way of therapeutics and treatments so that we don't send positive patients home to rest and recuperate, waiting for them to go from phase one of the infection to phase three, when now they need a ventilator and are in the ICU? Where is the push for people to get out, to exercise, to use supplements? Where is, where is the, the, the push for them to not be fearful and to live? Where is the transparency? There are very real concerns about these new vaccines. People I know personally have experienced severe reactions. Some have died from these vaccines. They were pushed long before any rigorous testing was performed. And now we are told that the last bar to full acceptance is the FDA approval, and it has been removed. But the approval process itself raises some very unsettling questions of, it, of its own. What are the long-term effects? Again, we don't get to question that either. There is mounting and incontrovertible evidence that fully vaccinated individuals can and do both acquire and transmit COVID-19 and its variants. So why are we being told that we are free to congregate and mingle if we have the golden ticket of full vaccination? Even the current data on Guam shows that the line between the pandemic of the unvaccinated versus the pandemic of the asymptomatic vaccinated is being blurred. This mandate might have made sense if the evidence showed that the vaccination actually prevented COVID-19 infection and transmission, but it doesn't. Uh, Ms. Posada earlier said that the vaccine has proven to be effective, and then in the same breath, she said that it may not necessarily prevent you from getting infected with the virus. That is the very definition of ineffective. What has, proven, what has been proven is that the vaccination does not prevent COVID-19. As such, wouldn't the vaccine passport be nothing short of a ticket to actually spread COVID? It is irresponsible, unscientific, unscientific, and not in the best interests of public health and safety. Should we mandate diets due to the widespread diabetes issues? Should we mandate cutting down all of the puga trees because betel nut causes oral cancer? Should we mandate closing all of the establishments serving alcohol because of liver disease? The slope is a very slippery one. Civil liberties allow for individuals, not the government, to have the freedom to decide what is or is not in their best interest. That's what happens in a democracy. The vaccines are now authorized on an emergency use basis for children 12 and over. So my 12-year-old cannot go into his gymnastics class, but his 10-year-old brother can. And we're being told that the virus knows whether 10 people at a table belong to the same party than 10 people at the other table. Either this is a brilliant virus or the result of some serious, seriously arbitrary and inconsistent lawmaking. All of this points to a, to a conclusion that this executive order, indeed, the whole response to COVID-19 since the beginning, has been guided more by politics and funding rather than science, and is being used as a means of social control rather than safety. As a side note, CNN reported on May 21st, the COVID-19 vaccines have created at least nine new billionaires after shares and companies producing the shots soared. The goalpost has moved again. We now sit again at the edge of 80% vaccination and the stated goal of herd immunity. And we should be able to have that right to decide 
if this is the choice for our family. I mentioned my three happy, healthy kids. I am not anti-vaccination, much less anti-science. My kids received all of their um, childhood vaccinations. Coming from India, I know that vaccinations can save lives, but my kids have never gotten a flu shot. Guess what else they haven't gotten? The flu. And, and you know, they, they have strong immunities and they are healthy. And if they did get the flu, I'm confident that their bodies and their white blood cells will do the, their God-given jobs. It is for my children and the hundreds of other children on Guam that I speak up. Please conclude. I mentioned I am from India and a country where unlike the United States, freedom of speech is not a right. I am thankful to my creator for, to be living on US soil and a constitution that affords me that right. I ask that you recognize this executive order as the gross overstep that it is and reconsider the position of the government of Guam that the government of Guam has taken towards this vaccination. Vaccine cards and segregation will not stop the virus. What it will do is stop me and many other responsible, decent and healthy people from accessing and enjoying the same rights and privileges as everybody else. I call on you senators to do the job your constituents elected you to do. The people voted you to be their voices. Make the changes in the laws that allows the governor full control over this emergency and what constitutes a state of emergency. We all must have a voice and a seat at the table. To the senators here tonight, thank you. I thank you for being here. To the senators that did not attend, you have made my point. This is not a health crisis. It's a political one. God bless Guam, God bless America, and God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Beth Britt. That concludes uh, the person signed up for, to provide testimony. Senators, I'm going to allow five minutes each. You can ask questions or you can make a statement, uh, but please keep it to five minutes. Uh, and um, we will begin, we will end with the sponsor of the bill giving a closing statement, of course. So uh, I would just first like to say thank you to everybody. I appreciate your testimony very much and the effort that you've made to come here and wait and uh, provide this testimony to all of you. And, um, and also, I hope, uh, it's my goal tonight in holding this hearing just to let you all know that, that we want to hear you and that uh, we hear you. And so um, we're going to take what you've said and make it available to the rest of our colleagues, to the public, and to the governor as well. Thank you. And so with that, I'm going to ask Senator Brown if you have any uh, statements or questions? I'll keep my comments short. I've been sitting in this chair for seven hours now since uh, the oversight hearing for public health as well as the speaker since two o'clock and I think I'm kind of losing my voice but I do appreciate all of you that have also waited uh, this afternoon and have taken the time to provide your testimony uh, and relay your concerns. I certainly hope, uh, I certainly heard your, your, your testimony today and appreciate again your time and your effort for doing what you have the right to do, to speak your mind and say how you believe your government should represent you. Thank you very much. I hope you have a safe evening home. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Duenas. Situs Masi, Madam Chair, and to the panel that's here, even some that I don't disagree with, I agree with your right to absolutely express yourself and I think your minds are clear, coherent, and I think you're making your presentation today on your true belief, and you've done it in a very articulate and meaningful way. To say that something's not a mandate when you have to go to a business and sign a form under penalty of perjury, I think is the very essence of a mandate. To say that a business could be fined up to $10,000 for not enforcing that mandate is clearly a mandate. To say that you have a choice to subject yourself to weekly testing as a discipline for not getting a vaccine 
clearly is a mandate. I am not anti-vax. My office is fully vaccinated. They made that decision for themselves. I do agree with science that I believe came out of Israel. I am a COVID survivor and I trust my immune system. That's my choice. So I will continue to hear those voices, not for political fortune. It is never a good feeling to stand in the face of seeing people divided and saying that you're doing that for political fortune. I resent that remark. I believe it's part of doing our job to hear your voices, even the ones I disagree with. That's our job. And to make a decision going forward. When Attorney Terlahi spoke, who I have a lot of respect for, I saw what she was talking about, but there's been some other legal observations tonight in terms of what the laws of Guam mean. And I'm going to seek out her counsel afterwards to find out if she believes that chapter 19, because of the governor's almighty powers, should be basically discarded in its entirety, then what is she asking us then to use our powers to, if we don't agree with a mandate that's handed down to our people? That's our process. That's what co-equal branches of government do. And it was refreshing to hear her legal analysis based on what happened in the case that was recently brought before the Supreme Court was based not necessarily on the fact that we shouldn't have powers as a co-equal branch of government, but that our powers don't exist because of a document that's insufficient. That's what she said. She said the organic Dr. Guam didn't give you the same powers that states have. Many of you have been watching what's been happening in many states. State legislatures have overturned and taken away certain powers of draconian governors. The state of Michigan, the state of Georgia, the state of Pennsylvania. There is a large growing list. Not because they don't want safety for their people, but they want a measurement that balances the rights. And I want to close with this. I do not disrespect the governor of Guam. I respect the position. I question motivations of a person sometimes. But I'm going to tell you, every single one of you here tonight, whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, and everybody who's watching on TV, the governor of Guam did not make 80% of the people become vaccinated on Guam. People chose to do that. They are the heroes. Don't ever let some politician or anybody else tell you that you owe them for what you did. You don't owe anybody for your decisions. Those are your decisions. And nobody should stand up on the top of a mountain and say, look at me. I achieved herd immunity because of me. No, you achieved herd immunity if you would not have made that decision. And some of us achieved it by God seeing us through and surviving. So tonight, please drive home safely. And this demonstration of the democratic process has carried out exactly like it was designed by our founders. Sidious Masi, Madam Speaker. Sidious Masi, Senator Duenas. Senator Taitikwi. Sidious Masi, Madam Speaker. And um, to those who, the last panel, I'd like to thank you especially for staying on and usually most people would forget, uh, you know, give up and, and head home. But I'm, I'm really happy to see that you, you stayed and provided some great testimony, um, very heartfelt testimony too as well. Um, and I also like to thank those who provided letters uh, that were sent to our office. I know many people who were not able to make it. Uh, we received letters like almost daily, like, you know, five, six letters daily for the last three, four weeks. So there are quite, quite a bit of individuals too who uh, did not testify, but 
uh, we receive these letters. Thank you for that. Um, you know, I think, uh, Madam Speaker, one of my biggest concerns uh, that I brought up earlier was the fact of individuals leaving their positions because they feel they're forced to take uh, the vaccine that they, you know, they don't want to take a vaccine. And we're losing teachers, we're losing nurses in some areas. And this is a great concern. Um, and I think there's quite a bit of people out there who, you know, have that same concern as well. Um, and I think there are many people who are already vaccinated who also feel that people should have that right too. I'm, I'm vaccinated and I feel that people should have that right. Um, Romeo Carlos uh, gave some great testimony, uh, brought some things to light uh, that are interesting, uh, a perspective, <clears throat> a different perspective that hasn't been brought up all night tonight, the fact that we have a choice and I think the concern is that we're seeing some of these states who are now moving into certain areas of liberties uh, are rights. And just the mere fact of it might be happening on Guam is enough to bring people to the table, regardless if there is a, you know, uh, a choice at this point. There may not be one. And I think that's one of the biggest concerns. That being said, um, I encourage everyone to continue to send in your testimonies for or against. It's important that we hear your voices. Uh, we work for you and it's important that uh, we bring your concerns to the table when it's time to uh, discuss these bills. I'd like to thank you, Madam Speaker, for holding this um, public hearing. Uh, I think you knew it was gonna be a long one. Uh, and uh, I appreciate all the time that you put into this and the staff at the legislature who's been there just as long as we have, especially you, the IT side. I greatly appreciate it. Please everyone, stay safe, wear your mask, distance, wash your hands. Please, we'll keep everyone safe that way. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Taitsugui. Now we'll have the sponsor uh, with a closing statement on the bill, Senator Blas. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to my colleagues that uh, were here, to colleagues that were uh, online, and then rest assured, I've been getting text messages from my other colleagues that weren't here too as well. Okay, so um, tonight we have heard a myriad of sentiment, um, of uh, concern, of disgust, of disdain, of disagreement. But that's part of the de democratic process that we're in, okay? That's a part of the democratic process that we want to continue to sustain. And that's the part of, part of the democratic process that I applaud you for taking the time to be a part of. The four of us here, yes, a representative of you, and the four of us here have gotten an earful from you tonight. Were there for or against? Because the four of us here have to make up with the rest of the body that's going to have to ultimately decide the fate of Bill 176 or Bill 180. You know, and it comes down to this. It, for, for me... My intent and my author, the reason why I authored the bill is it goes right back to the concern that we have. We recognize what the powers of the governor are, but we also recognize what the power and what the concerns of the people are. This is a democratic government. And even in times when, you, when, when, when there's a discussion about emergency and emergent decisions, we recognize if something happens, you know, if there was an earthquake right now, knock on wood, so there's nothing happened tonight, okay? That there are gonna be times there are gonna be decisions that are gonna be made. I think one of the things that you heard earlier tonight, which is what we wanted to bring about in the discussion, is a lot of things that were been made in as far as mandates, okay, could have resulted as a result of having conversations with our people. There was no emergent reason it was, the, it, was the, it was the testimony of the public health director himself that said they were in it for months. 
What these bills would intend to do, wants to do, and it has done tonight is to bring the voice of the people into that discussion and to move that forward. We in no way in any of the bills, I, I looked at the bills, and there is no way that basically says, Governor, you cannot do that. You can't do what you want to do. What we're saying is, Governor, before you do that, please have a, conversa have a conversation with the people that are going to be most affected by it. That's what it's saying. It doesn't say that despite what was pre presented earlier that if, we, if, we, if these bills were to, to be passed that the government has no authority to be able to, to vaccinate people. It didn't say that. It didn't say that the way that the governor had used um, in as far as encouragement to get to that 80% that she was looking for. Because that, remember, I don't know if you heard it earlier. They got to that 80 percentile minus a mandate. What was the necessity for it? Okay? It in no way wanted to usurp her power. It wanted to make sure that in the decisions to make, in, 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 in the ways that she's making the decision, that there's the governed that also has a process in this democratic society that we live in. That's what we're asking for. And I agree. Romeo, thank you. A lot of this is, comes from the mass confusion from communications. I was honored today. I think I'm going to hold the honor, Madam Speaker. If you know, I had the most directors in, in one public hearing at any one time, even in the budget process. It's an honor. I'm going to hold. Hold. We're going to hold to our on our backs. But it was necessary so that the people can be heard. And that's all that we're asking. Listen to us too. We. Some cases, people may call us the minority, but we're still here. So thank you very much. You know, it's 9.15 on a Friday. Yeah. Wouldn't be anywhere else. Thank you for taking the time tonight. This fight, okay? This conversation, this discussion. This way to be able to get us out together, to bring back unity, to bring back the unity that this island deserves, has to live by. This hasn't ended. Okay? So thank you. Thank you all. For the, thank you. Sisu Samasi, Senator Blath. There being no additional individuals to present testimony, the committee will consider Bills 176-36LS and Bill 180-36LS duly heard. The public hearing is now adjourned. The time is 9.15 p.m. Sitsuos Masi told us. Good night.